Welcome everybody. Hi, I'm Karen Johnson. Thank you for tuning in and watching my new podcast, my new interview with Efret Shokam. And I love talking to Efret. Efret has had a near-death experience and she um, wants to share her piece of this big puzzle of near-death experiences. And also want to talk a little bit about her upcoming book that she's written. It's called The Forgotten Promise, Journey from Absent Parenting to Involved or Spiritual Parenting, Spiritual Parenting. So yeah, and um, Efrit's currently living in Israel, right? Yeah. And, and she's a shaman. And so this is how we met and, and became acquainted with each other. She's a wife, she's a mother. She's got two children? Three. Three children. Three girls. Three yeah. girls. Oh my gosh, that's a big, <laughs> big, wonderful undertaking. And um, so, uh, you know, from the very first time I met Efrat, I just felt her filled with light and love. It was just emanating, and I wanted to, I wanted to know what that was about. What did that come from? You can kind of see her glow and her, her love and her presence. So, I wanted to share her and her journey with everybody. So, welcome, Efrat. Thank you, Carrie. It's so wonderful to be um, in the presence of your luminosity. Oh, thank and, uh, you. I shine because I see you in front of me because it's so wonderful to see you and everything oh. that you bring to the world. So thank you. Yeah, thank as a you. start. <laughs> thank you. So I guess we'd just start, maybe start at the beginning. Tell us about that. How did you come to have this near-death experience, your accident, your yeah, so first, I guess I want to say that I don't call it an accident. Mm. I don't believe in accident. There's no, no accident, very well. accident yes. as we both know. Um, I refer to it as a car crash. It was a crash of two cars. The other driver um, lost control um, and uh, bumped into me. And... I fell apart, <laughs> you know, yeah, a serious crash. Um, multiple injuries we can talk for an hour just about the injuries Oof. so um to your body uh, what were you alone in the car so it was injured I was yeah luckily I was in an, alone in the car I just brought my daughter to um to her daycare she was uh, three years and four months and my twin girls 13 months old at the time were at home with my mom and my husband was also home um, and it was just really nearby, a few minutes from our house. Um, and yeah, luckily I was, wow, thank God, I was alone. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was alone. And then I was, uh, I, on the technical, physical part, I was taken to the hospital with a helicopter. I had, we, we live in the rural areas of Israel, and I had no chance of making it otherwise. Um, and I was in the ICU for a while and then hospitalized and then rehabilitation at home. Um, I was not functioning for a long time and not just physically dependent on everything. You know, I needed my food being cut. I needed help in everything. Mm. Um, I had a stoma being opened and then closed. Um, I, I couldn't walk. Many... <laughs> multiple injuries and you know that required a full physical reorganization but that's part of the invitation because if you want to become new at least for my in my story in, in the past I needed to walk I needed to reorganize my body um, and I was absent as a mother for many 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 months um, I couldn't even hug my girls you know it was just I was like this um, I was like a picture on the sofa, some of the, some of the hours. Um, yeah, I can talk to about it with a smile today because I have managed to become a, a mother to my daughters. Yes. Very present, very, um, I think the mother they chose to come to, you know, I hope I'm trying, I'm really trying. Um, so that is, that is like the technical story, but, um, can you describe a little for you, describe your near-death experience, what you call your near-death experience, and how was that for you? So I guess I, the second part of the story, it's like parallel stories, you know, and then it took them time to merge, was that as soon, I felt a sense of a boom coming, 
um, I did not see the crash take place or anything. And I was just not there. Um, people with near-death experience often report of going through a tunnel, what we, um, um, shamanic practitioner referred to as the Viracocha or eighth chakra, uh, going through that. Um, I do not recall that. And it took me some time to find out that many people that have accidents or fast, something happening very, very fast, um, don't recall that part. It's like you're immediately somewhere else. Uh -huh. In the most magnificent, magnificent place ever. We can't describe it in words. You know, I can try to describe it in words. It was, um, I think one of the major things I remember is being really, really calm. I did not feel any of the pain, anything. I didn't care what was going on there, down there with my body. I knew that I left my body somewhere, mm -hmm. but I didn't care about it. I was just surrounded in this luminous beauty. It is so bright that if we would be there with our human bodies, we wouldn't. We have. We would have to close our eyes, and we we wouldn't be able to see anything. It's just. <laughs> Uh, I can't explain it in words. It's just, it, it's, it's light coming out of light. Mm. It's not that candle shining in the dark, you know, and reflecting to, and, and bringing light and, and to something. It's just light stemming out of light. It's in its purest form. And even now when we talk about it, it's been 10 years. Um, I feel the... I feel the love that bubbled into my skin. It's like it's it it came down into my cell, and and um, there is a level of acceptance that suddenly the, it doesn't matter how your body looks and what you did right or what you did wrong, or if you did what you planned to do or if you didn't. It just, nothing matters. You're just perfect as you are, mm. and this is this was. <laughs> a new feeling to me, you know, I was, I was just um, absorbing this shimmering light and this understanding that that's what we are, you know, we are made of stardust mm -hmm. and we are made of, of, of love. And um, I guess, you know, just like a lot of shamanic experiences, we need to experience it ourselves. I needed that experience to yeah I understand today 10 years from from then that it's I needed that experience to realize who I am uh -huh. and it's who we all are you know it's not just who I am it's everybody we're all equal that's what we are all made of and I met my grandpa there mm. and it was it was as if he served as my guide. I could not, there was this boundary I could not cross. And I saw other souls cross it. I was not allowed to cross. I was, it was very clear. And then I was taken into this balcony and, and it was like the world was moving underneath. I saw it was a teaching, a lot of teaching, a lot of wisdom about about earth, about souls. Um, it was both very beautiful, but there were also very sad parts and painful parts to watch. It was like all aspects of our being it was amazing, amazing experience. I so not just I talk about being. it and I see the pictures in front of me. It wasn't just your being, it was you were seeing the earth, the people on the earth. Yeah, yeah. I was seeing not just it wasn't about me. I was not seeing things about me. I was grasping um, a more whole picture of what, what's going on around you. It felt like days. I saw so, so much, but basically it was less than five minutes, you know, in earthly time. And then I just looked, I had to go back. It was Time was over. I was told I had to go back. I, I was not given a choice. I'm not sure what my choice would have been. It was so 
it, it was so amazing up there. Um, I had to go back. I had to come back. And I knew I had to come back. And I just fell into my body. And that's when I felt the pain. You know, it was, again, the, the, the contradiction. But then when I was doing my rehabil rehabilitation process, I'm so sorry for my English mistakes. No, and, it's perfect. Um, I was uh, doing a lot of guided meditations. And then uh, I was, you know, it was always part of the guidance was go to a safe place. And I would go to that moment of that, of the car crash. Yeah. I almost said accident. Uh, to the moment of the car crash, you know, that was my safe place. It, 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 again, it's, it doesn't make sense because that's when my body broke. Um, but it was the safe place. That's where I belonged and what it was about. And I guess since I know that uh, some of you re um, your listeners are, yeah. are um or people co coping with loss. And I want to share something else I saw there, which always, um, um, I have tears in my eyes when I think about it. It's um, around me and around that border, which I was not allowed to cross. Um, souls were arriving. It's like, it's a constant, souls were arriving constantly. They were all enveloped in this love. Mm. It is, Sometimes it was just one being coming to them. Sometimes it was a group of beings coming around them. They were always coming in their purest form. Not just the beings coming to envelop and to hug and to, to welcome the soul back and to ease the transition. It was also the souls, you know, it didn't, it, they, it, it was taking off that human experience, whatever you, you did right whatever you didn't do right, it, whether you finished what you did, you wanted to finish or whether you had any regrets, nothing matters. It just doesn't matter. And that when people just continue on, that's when they go on home, you know? We often talk about grounding as being in our body, but then I often feel it's the opposite way around. When we're back there, that's when we're home. And we are here, we're out of, you know, it's Beautiful. that um, upside down thought. Um, so that is something I, I think people should know. And I think it really relates to what you you often talk about, about letting, the, let, letting them go and understanding that if we do not continue to walk our path and choose the gift that their loss brought us, which is, I know it's really hard to think about getting, being gifted something by somebody continuing on, but then uh, then we make them stuck and we yes. make their process hard because that affects them. Um, yes, oh gosh. So yeah, so I think many people know that I lost my son um, to a heroin overdose. And so we were talking a little bit about this before we started, but um, yeah, so, and he came after I saw him and it was so shocking. And then over time though, I realized that he is, he loves where he is and he comes and helps me all the time to help souls transition. Some people get a little stuck in between worlds. Yeah. So especially sometimes suicides, um, they, they feel like they don't deserve, but they do deserve. And so he's, he's able to help. And and he's you know, telling me, oh, I'm studying with this pod and I'm studying with that pod. And he used to come all the time. Now I kind of have to call on him. And sometimes he's like, mom, I'm busy learning over here. And he, but he, he loves where he is. So, and I wanted yeah. listeners to know that too, that there is a life after death. This is an eternal slumber. They're not slumbering over there. They're busy. They're learning. They're growing. It's their the souls are evolving, right? That's what yeah, you it's the opposite. It's it, they're happy there. I think they're I happy. would be happy there. I would. I'm very happy I came back because so many amazing things happen, and I'm a mother to my daughters. But I understand why Ben, your son, loves it there. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing, magnificent, and beautiful. It's it's a place where it here on earth we need to choose to be who we are yes. in our essence and there it's that's not an issue we just are who we are yeah. you know and 
Yeah. And it's so nice that he does communicate with you, you know? Yeah. Well, I, a lot of people, souls don't do that. Right. Well, it's, I always tell people say, well, if he's really went crossed over the other side, um, you know, or they're unwilling to let their loved one go, you know, they're kind of holding on to them, but it's not prison up there. You know, yeah. you, they can come back and they can message, they can go back and forth. It doesn't mean they're stuck in between worlds. It's, it's that they're visiting, but their home is there. Yes. Right? Their place of residence is there. They're just visit here. And so um, it doesn't mean they can't visit anymore. It just, you know, it just means that's where they're spending their time, you know? Yeah, that's where they need to be right that's now. Where they need to be. And so it's so beautiful. And so, um, and I always say the, my book coming out is Living Grieving. I'm looking forward. I think it's coming out <laughs> July of this year. Uh, and I think the title, we know that titles always change. I think it's going to be living, grieving, um, using energy medicine to alchemize grief. So, mm -hmm. um, but like uh, yeah. And one of the things that I was downloaded and gifted when I was writing this book, because the book, sometimes I look at different words I wrote and I think, I don't remember writing that. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's sort of as above, so below. And as we are stuck in our grief and, and refusing, we think we're honoring our loved one by refusing to move on, but we're keeping them stuck too. So as we move on and we use the energy of grief to alchemize our lives and transform, then they too are able to be free to transform. Yeah, so. they're free to transform and they are free to do they're not bounded into our linear time by us yes. pulling them back and pulling, back and back. Yeah. They're just free to do what they need to do and be who they are. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and then we had talked a little bit about this too, about um, sometimes people like you that have near death experiences don't want to talk about it. Yeah. I guess it's not, it's not that I didn't want to talk about it. I really wanted to talk about it. But I felt it was a weird thing to talk about. Yeah. So as I shared with you earlier, it took me time to realize what happened and that what happened um, has a name and that it's very common to have those experiences in all kinds of situations. But even once I understood that, I even I remember once trying to talk to a friend, which I thought was really, really spiritual. And she just changed the topic of the conversation I was like if I can't talk to her then who can I talk to about this yeah. it is it was too much for people to that's what I experienced at the time I was not coherent because it was so it was such a big mess of the physical and the and the spiritual and what's going on and who am I and so I think it was very hard for people to even correspond to my tries to share it's not like today when I'm I know who I am right and I, and I took off anything I need, didn't need and I can just walk what I need to walk and 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 share the story um, but it was a lot about my integration and you know, we talked about it also that your experience was Ben and my near-death experience it's something happened and, and it's like this enlightened moment but then you need to bring it into the reality of life. And that takes time. Yes. That takes time. People expect that if you had such an experience, okay, so you're, you know everything. And, and I came back with a lot of answers to questions I never asked. You know, it was like, why do I know this? And why do I need to know this? But, but I did. And, and it was, I needed to integrate it into my life. And, and the integration, it's both in, me accepting it and accepting yes. what happened and what I know and the doors that opened to me I was very sensitive and, and intuitive from childhood but I really I, that was really scary for me I had no guidance yes. so I needed to open up to the doors that opened and all the journey and I was going back and forth constantly and then also communicate what I, I suddenly knew as truth even in the little details of my family life Oh. Like my mom, that my parents really, really were very, very helpful um, around the car crash. They literally, on that day, moved to live in our house. Um, but I saw how they would say something to my daughters. I, I, 
it took time, you know, how to know we should say that differently. And a few weeks earlier, I would say things the same way they would, you know, because that's what I knew and I felt it was right and was good parenting, but suddenly I felt something new. And then it was weaving it, weaving it. And it's like one element, the food, how we talk, um, what type of things and decorations we have in the house? What do we spend our time on? It was weaving it into very, very little elements. It takes time. Yes. It takes a long time. It takes a long yeah. time. Yeah, the same thing, you know, I was talking to you about when I first saw my son and I'm thinking I had no context yeah. for see, he appeared in front of me and I'm like, oh, oh, my mind was like, what do I do with this? Oh, he must be alive. He must, he yeah. must not have died. They have to go check and make sure because I think, he, you know, I was so confused, you know, I couldn't. And then, you know, suddenly my whole life didn't make sense. Like, what am I doing? I, I don't, I hate this job. I don't like when I, you know, I was a judge in Washington, DC. I'm like, I'm bored with this. I'm tired of this traffic. I'm tired of the, I don't want to live this way. And, um, you know, so it was a process of changing everything and also finding people along the way came as like serendipity. P the people I needed to understand and process appeared. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it took a long time, you know. Yeah. And meanwhile, all the people you have in your life or you had in your life think you lost it. <laughs> no, totally. Totally. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And, you, yeah. and I didn't want to go. I knew that I wanted to keep seeing my son and I didn't want to go to a traditional medical doctor because they'd say, oh, she's gone psychotic. She needs to be medicated, right? So yeah. I knew I didn't want that. So, you know, it's hard to get the help you need when you're trying to negotiate this big thing that is outside the norm and you don't yeah. want it medicated. I don't want my son medicated away. I, I knew that much. I wanted to continue to experience it. I wanted to explore more you know, I could see him, I couldn't hear him. So I went to um, a medium who could hear him. And she said, you know, I think you've got some skills too. And I'm like, I don't know, but you know, everything. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Everything's set up. He's right there. He's standing right there. What's he saying? You know? And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, but it, it, it does. And maybe you found that true too, that the, the people you needed, the information you needed came to you. Yeah, yeah, completely. The information I needed came and, and it came when I was ready. Yes. I needed to, it wasn't just, you know, a process of, of okay, now I know everything and now things happen. I too, I needed to integrate it. I needed to change. I needed to accept what happened yes. and to make choices. And every, and every step, the right people came in. Yes. Um, the right opportunities, the right direction, the, the learning, the teaching, the opportunity to become a shamanic practitioner. Yeah. It was, that was part of it. The little, yeah, yeah. And it's a process, you know, it takes a lot of, lot of time. Yeah. Um, about four and a half years after the crash, I met a woman who experienced, was wounded uh, from a terror attack. Uh -huh. But our, our wounding, our places of our bodies were really similar. We we were treated in the same hospitals, the same doctors, and and she had this amazing pre dance performance showing what happened to her. And um, we talked with her at the end, and then she said, "Oh, you're just four and a half years after your car crash. That's nothing, you know." <laughs> and I was like, four and a half years. I should be moving on, right?" You know. And now it takes time. It takes exactly. time. It all takes time. And um, yeah, like you say, you integrate it and step by step because it kind of challenges our rational mind and how we were raised and cultural norms. And so, you know, we're kind of stretching our awareness, stretching possibilities. And it, it's kind of, mm -hmm. you know, we're, it's kind of tight. So we're like, mm, you know, whittling away. And, and I love this because I think so many of my listeners have had similar experience, near-death experiences, or had someone die and see them and not know what to do and, and realize that if they talk to certain people, people are going to think they're crazy. They say things like, well, it's time to get over it. It's time to move on. Whose time? Right? Wh whose time are we talking to? We never get over it. We get through it. We get um, information. We learn and grow. But, you know. So, yeah. so I kind of want to, one of the things I want people to know is that have had near-death experiences or know somebody that has, it's okay. 
right? It's it's really there, and it okay, can be isn't okay. It's, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for growth, and it's like a, it's this beautiful hand of light being that reached out to them and to those around them. Yes, I always feel that my my near death experience is is no longer mine you know yes. it was my experience but i'm at the point of i want to share it i wrote about it in the book it's yet to find a home but i know it's time is <laughs> will come yes, yes. Um, and and it's i think so many people have those experiences not just you know our community of sh shamans that have this these experiences uh, initiations yeah but um but i think so many people have them and there's so many books because People need to know. It's like being a messenger of the, of this information. Yes. It's not our own. Yes. Oh, exactly. Oh, totally. I totally feel that. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, what did you bring back down? What was important for you that you brought back down to this realm? Yeah. So I guess it, every day I would say, I, I would give you a different answer, <laughs> you know, because it's, so it's big. evolving it's big and it's evolving and um while, while as shamans we can do uh, we can work with divination i personally don't want to know what's coming tomorrow right and they, yeah yeah it's enough it's enough you know managing today and the next few days no yeah. not even more you know being a shaman and a mom and everything but um if i look back i think for me it opened the door uh i would I think I would relate to three doors. Um, one is becoming a shamanic practitioner and bringing uh, my ability to mediate healing to others yes. um, into, you know, into form, into into physical reality, um, being able to do it. And it's an amazing gift. And I'm so grateful for the training and everything that I learned and the teachers and really, wow, I could not expect more. It was amazing, amazing process still going on, constantly learning. Um, the second gift was it opened my writing. Mm. Um, I started writing and I have the book <coughs> and I have a soon to be website that I will share a lot of content that I write. Um, and that is also related to the third, which is, I, I feel my focus is the, um, spiritual children you know those um and i take my work also to shamanic work with children most of my clients are actually families the children and their parents and you know a kid shows up they call for one kid and then i already know i need to make sure i can accept six new clients because it's also the father and the mother and israeli families are fairly large so it's three to four children um so there are also from around the world but mostly israelis and it's like um that's where my practice is going and i guess that it's part of what i learned when i came back i was absent as a mother i was not functioning at all and i i was very devoted before that my motherhood was i guess the one definition self-definition i was not willing to let go of i was in a, i i um before the car crash i was in an academic um um path um, I was supposed to have a position at the university and I, I was lecturing, I was teaching all kinds of, I could let go of, it doesn't, didn't matter all the years of training and studying and the investment, it just nothing mattered. Yeah. But being a mom was the one thing that mattered. I wanted to be their mom. And, um, and then I wanted to share with them this serene experiment, experience of, of, of divine love. Uh -huh. And then I noticed while I was healing and watching them and not being able to be a mom, I noticed that when I'm precise to my truth, when I'm connected to who I am, I suddenly don't feel the pain. I could go to, to the hospital and, and, desen and desensitize myself so I wouldn't feel the, the, uh, the medical procedures. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was not precise, pain came back, you know? It, now it really makes sense today with everything I know about psychosomatic health, but then, and it made me realize on the deep level of things, a truth that is probably known to everybody, but I had to experience it was that 
when I'm true to who I am, I feel this divine love on earth in my body. Uh -huh. And then if you take it a few steps forward, if I want my daughters to live this way, I need to find the conditions and the ways that they can be who they are in their essence. And that is, and, and, and when we, when we raise our kids, they want to eat. We tell them, no, you're going to be hungry, hungry only in half an hour, you know, because we have a phone call to answer, or you need to sleep in these and these hours. And it starts from such an early age. And then a friend wants to come over and you have plans, but then you don't tell the other mom, no, sorry, we have plans. You say some excuse because it's as if you want to be polite or you don't want to, you know, make her feel bad that you decide that your kid wanted to meet another kid but then we teach them that truth doesn't matter yes and we, and we feel their schedule with so many um activities they don't have time to meditate with themselves you know just stare on outside in the sky or just draw and and there's so many kids like that and so it took me to those to the very essences of what who we are as parents and what, what our kids um, expect for us from very spiritual agreements before they chose to come to us and how the motion and how the development that we do as parents um, yeah. helps them be who they are. And I think I shared with you that I journey with my daughters. And at some point last year, we were in the US for the whole year, which is an amazing year, mostly in Santa Fe and then in California. And um, when we came back, the, my daughter said, okay, we need to have a journeying group with our friends because they wanted to share their, you know, those gifts that we get from the shamanic work and from knowing how to stop and how to communicate with our, they communicate with their guides. They know how to get guidance. They know how to stop and center themselves. It's like very basic things. Kids, just like kids shower and brush their teeth. They need to know how to work with their energy field. So my girls actually organized a journey group. I love we it. Have like four moms and the girls and the girls' friends. Um, and it's um, it's who they are. And I couldn't say no to it because it's that's who they are in their essence, you know. I, I that's love what I want to foster. Finding that and being open to it. And you know, so many of us want our children to do it the way we did it. And letting go of that, you know, our, yeah. you know, letting go of that and do it your way, you know, and that's my biggest gift. I think I got out of everything with my daughter. It freed me to back up and, and appreciate who she is instead of that aspect of the mom. Oh, I got to tell her, I better show her. She might not know. I better instruct her. I could let go of being the instructor, the supervisor. And I mean, she's 30 now, but it is that. And so it changed our relationship. So I'm, totally here to listen. And I listen as long until she says, what do you think, you know? And if she doesn't want to know what I think, it's okay, I, I can just listen. You know, yeah, I guess it's, we it's acceptance that we, that we walk listen. together, you know, that we walk together. We walk it's not together. a parent leading. Right. And what a gift that you can have such a relationship with your daughter, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not, it can't be taken for granted. No, and and, and so I think the best, part was, you know, I was leaving my, I, re, I left my job as a judge. I w sold everything in my house. I went on a two and a half year world journey. And my friends, some of my friends came to her and said, you know, your mother's grieving. She's going to regret this, blah, blah, blah. My daughter said, I think my mother should shake her rattle and release her inner butterfly. <laughs> I, <laughs> what bigger love is that? right? That's like totally. Yeah, you are blessed that she chose you as her mom. Yes, I am so blessed. I'm yeah. so lucky. And so now, even though she's not, she's an engineer, she's not on the you know right brain very much, but obviously she has it. So I can sing the Gayatri mantra chant to the babies and my grandson. And she's just <laughs> like, okay, that's, yes, that's grandma. You know, she, <laughs> and she, <laughs> we're a coach uh, or we do whatever, you know, so it's, um, it's changed everything. That is so beautiful. It's just that part of that acceptance because I think that's true to every process that once we walk our essence, our environment, our loved ones, it doesn't matter if they're 
different. They accept us because it's yes. essence. It's like this lighthouse that, that shines to another lighthouse and, and it doesn't matter how it looks. Um, and I think that a lot of people are afraid. I yes. was surely afraid to be who I am when I realized the path I need to walk and everything I know about your story. It's the same. It, it, it's not an easy process. No. But then once you walk your path, walk who you are, everything aligns. Yeah. There is no other way for it to be. It doesn't matter how difficult it looks. No. And it and I think, you know, we are sort of we are that guideline guide person, that messenger, because as I became more real and as I was leaving my home and leaving everything behind, talking to neighbors and people that I thought you know, would judge me and are rigid and but my being broken open allowed them to admit that their life wasn't so perfect. Their yeah. children weren't so perfect. They have fears and concerns. And instead of all of us behind this wall of, oh, everything, my life's perfect. Oh, my children are perfect. My life is perfect. We could sit and have a cup of tea and cry. Really? really, really, and talk about what really, really is truth and what really, really we're worried about instead of spending all our energy on this fake facade. It was so beautiful. I mean, people that I never thought would be that way, would break open, would be, were so open. Once I was completely open and broken and available and available to listen. Available. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's another point I wanted to say. I know you've got um, uh, an, uh, a course coming up, right? Yeah, it's more of a study group, not study a course. Group? I'm not. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to be teaching it, uh, but I am organizing it, and uh, some uh, other colleagues will also be taking part in leading it. Yeah, it's uh, focusing on shamanic work with children. Yeah. And as while the essence of the work is the same, mm -hmm. um, the intic exit is different um how we journey with children is different the challenges we face you know a lot of kids are have psychic abilities but then we need to be very we want them to keep them open but we also need to be very aware of their surroundings and what they can do it can do it's, it's a very delicate walk yes. with when working with children and families so it's a gathering of the colleagues uh, to think together to work on case studies together to um, and yeah, and we have a few spots open. So we, as we spoke, we said we should bring it up. Maybe there are a few of your listeners that work with children or wish to work with children or yeah. have little shamans at home. And they are very much welcome to contact me and join us. It's at the end of this month. It's really coming up, but then. Yes. So we're going to put that link on the website yes. so that people can get in touch with you because I cool. think it's so beautiful. And so many people now that have worldwide that have been staying at home with children much more than ever before are mm -hmm. like oh my gosh how that's a challenge how can I be present how can I you know it's overwhelming sometimes what do I do with my own overwhelm my my I don't have that uh, quiet hours I don't have that time away when they went to school and so we've all had to rethink our our time together you know and it's not always easy because like you it's say, not easy, but you know, it's much more natural my, yeah. to my opinion. I think oh, it's much more natural day. once you, but we had to make a shift. From yeah, and it's a lot of adjustment. It's adjustment. a lot of, adjustment. It's a lot of uh, understanding and accepting that that's what's going on and, and allowing ourselves to become kids again because we need to play with them more hours. And so yes. And... Yeah. yeah, I always wish my girls wouldn't go to school and they wanted oh, yeah. to go to school. I wanted them to stay home and be homeschooled. After last go. year, I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, but I'm, you know, I I look at the pile of laundry and I always uh, express my <laughs> gratitude that I'm able to fold the laundry because I was not able to. So I'm very happy that I can do all those little things. Uh, yeah, gratitude takes uh, interesting forms, you know, and it does. You have a it does, you know, even gratitude. I'm so grateful for Ben, right? His death opened a doorway. So gratitude took a different form. It's like, oh my gosh, death is not the end. Death is only the beginning. And we've continued, he and I, to journey together in a different way. Yeah. 
I need broad gifts. Yes, all the gifts, yeah. Like your book is coming up and I have so many people I wanna give your book to, so I'm really <laughs> waiting. <laughs> Uh, let's see what other things anything else um anything else you want our listeners to know anything you, a takeaway for them yeah i'm trusting what comes to my mind now you know it's speaking through me that um it doesn't matter what others say it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone, I feel like I'm talking to one or two or three of your listeners. It's like a message coming through, yeah. if to be precise, a message coming through to, to a few listeners that it's, um, it doesn't matter what others say. If you know something and you, we always talk about it this in the shamanic path that it is not something that can be taught. It is something you need to experience. Yes. And, um, and if any of your listeners had an experience, then trust what you know mm. and, and just follow that, that golden thread sent to you and just trust that and walk it and walk it. And know it takes time. We've talked about, talked about it earlier. Yes. That it takes time and that it's okay that it takes yes. time oh that's yeah. beautiful oh thank you so much oh thank you for thank joining. you karen thank you and for it's been lovely chatting here <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to chat it's, lo it's fun to be together again yes oh gosh so we'll be look forward to hearing about your book and we'll talk to, uh, let people know about this um workshop sort of thing that you're having and Wonderful. And, uh, Thanks. Beautiful the work you're doing with children and families and that that was your little piece of the puzzle that you're expanding on that you brought down. Yeah, for now, I guess. For now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what's coming tomorrow. <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen.